Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted to have you with us. As you probably know, we're studying the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church for three-month period from July through September of 2013. This is number six in that series. The series is entitled Revival and Reformation, and this particular lesson is entitled Confession and Repentance, The Conditions of Revival. As you probably figured out if you watched us before, we have a special handout which we sort of follow, sort of follow, uh, in our discussions here. If you'd like to have a copy of that and get some ideas maybe for your Sabbath school class, that's available on our website at theox, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G, <coughs> theox dot O-R-G, and there's a lot of interesting biblical material available there if you want to take a look. Before we begin, we hope that you will have a Bible at the ready, and you've got it in your hand. And let's begin with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, how can we thank you enough for the gift of the Holy Spirit, for the example of Jesus, and for your own personal care and guidance for our lives? It's hard for us to imagine why the King of the Universe would care for each one of us as, as his personal child. But that's the message which we get from the inspired sources. And Jesus, we want to find better and better ways in the 21st century to do what you would have done if you had been here. We know you are here, but uh, we can't see you. We can't see your actions openly but we ask that you will work through us, through our minds and through our hearts and through our hands and feet to do your will for all around us is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Confession and repentance. Are they the same or are they different? Well, there are some exa outstanding examples of repentance in Scripture. Probably one of the, one, one of the ones that's most widely understood and studied is the example of David after his sin with Bathsheba. You probably know that it was about a year later that he finally decided to confess his sin when he was sort of pointed out rather bluntly that uh, God knew exactly what he had done. And he has a psalm, so two of them, Psalm 32 and Psalm 51, that talk about his uh, discretions. Um, so, Take a look at those, if you will, and we'll, we'll be talking about those, but there are also a lot of other examples of confession and repentance in, in the Bible, and probably the one that was the most impressive in its results was the time between the resurrection of Jesus and Pentecost. You remember, Jesus was still around. He would sort of come and go for about 40 days, and then in the last 10 days, before Pentecost, from day 40 to about day 50, roughly, uh, Jesus was, I'm, I'm sorry, he had already ascended back to heaven, uh, there from the Mount of Olives, and the disciples got together and they said, we have to put aside all our differences, we have to confess our wrongings of each other, we've got to realize that we have a job to do. We are supposed to carry the gospel to the entire world. And now we're talking about a time when the fastest transportation was a horse. And most of them didn't have horses, mostly they walked. And you're trying to pre present, uh, carry the gospel to the world? Well, we know what the incredible result was. On the day of Pentecost, there was a remarkable thing which we'll talk about in more detail. Just to give you a hint about the, how great that change was, look at Luke 22:24. Now, you need to gaze a little bit higher in your Bibles, and if you have subheadings in your Bible, you notice one above it, my Bible says, the Lord's Supper. And where did that happen? The upper room. In the upper room, and you go down a bunch of verses, and you get down to 24, and it says, an argument broke out among the disciples as to which one of them should be thought of as the greatest. Was that in the upper room? You think, think that could have happened in the upper room? I think by then they would have 
Well, they've been running around with Jesus for three years. Yeah. yeah. Amazing. How, how could they, at that point in time, you know, after all that Jesus had done for them and so forth, still be arguing about which one of them is going to be prime minister? And yet, in, in our, the point of our lesson today is, look what happened over those next seven weeks. Incredible. And, of course, it turned the world upside down. Could that happen again? If probably happens every day in one way or another. I suspect that if we have the concept that there's going to be an earthly organization and people are going to be involved in it, there will be political intrigue to get to the top of that organization. And that's what they thought was going to happen. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until they figured out that that was not going to happen that they quit worrying about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a little hard to figure out how you can have an earthly king when he just disappeared, isn't it? That's right. <laughs> well, look at some of the things that did happen as a result of that experience. You remember that Peter denied his Lord three times. Well, this is what happened a few weeks later. Acts 4, yeah. verse 13. The members, now, now Peter and John have been called to witness what in the world they were doing before the Sanhedrin. So they're standing before Congress, the Congress of their day. Okay? The members of the council were amazed to see how bold Peter and John were and to learn that they were ordinary men of no education. I mean, how can you stand here and sound so bold and like you really know what you're talking about when you, you didn't get your education at our schools? They realized then that they had been companions of Jesus. I wonder what difference that made. Does Jesus want us to be bold or to be humble? The two seem to be contradictory of each other. I think if it's, a, if it's time to talk about the gospel, we need to be bold. Mm -hmm. Look at a few verses later, well, into the next chapter. Chapter 5, Acts 5, verses 30 through 32. The God of, and this is Peter preaching, the God of our ancestors raised Jesus from death after you had killed him by nailing him to a cross. I mean, is he, is he pussyfooting around the issues here? God raised him to his right-hand side as leader and savior to give the people of Israel the opportunity to repent and have their sins forgiven. We are witnesses to these things, and we and the Holy Spirit, who is God's gift to those who obey him. <laughs> I, you know, I, I try to imagine what it would be like to be, be sitting there in the, you know, in the bleachers somewhere, behind a pillar somewhere, and watching... Caiaphas, as this is being said. Now, how did the disciples know that God wanted the Jewish people who had just killed him to repent and obtain the Holy Spirit? Were, were the disciples trained that in that forgiveness already? I mean, it seems like you killed Jesus and you're going to go someplace else, you know? But they mm -hmm. said, no, repent and get the Holy Spirit. So. That was an unusual message. Usually people are full of revenge. You did something wrong, yeah. so, you know, you can't repent and... Re and <clears throat> the only, only possible explanation <coughs> that I can think of for that is that when Jesus died and then he rose on Sunday, they spent the next seven weeks in a fruit basket upset mode. They said, you know, we had, we had this idea all along about how Jesus was going to be the king of the Jews and all that was going to happen. And now we've got to rethink everything. And rethinking everything led to this. So they had to repent to get the Holy Spirit, and that's what they wanted everybody to do, the experience they had, the fruit basket experience. If you had just been through Pentecost as one of the speakers, would you want everybody to have that experience? Yes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So what is the role of repentance and confession in the lives of Christians? <coughs> is there a false kind of repentance? No, and there's a false kind of everything. Okay. Well, what is it? What exactly is happening when you repent? Are you just saying you're sorry? Or are you, are you actually thinking about the way you thought about it before and you're and you've done a turnaround and you're confessing this turnaround to explain your turnaround. Uh, 
you know, it just seems like there's, there's a change happening here. It's not just an automatic thing where you say, okay, I got to say I'm sorry, you know, and, and everything's good now. Okay. In, in the Greek, the word is metanoia. It means a turning around. It's, you know, this is, this is like a convertible changes its top, okay? Uh, something like that. It's a, com it's a difference, a complete change. It means turn around and go back the other direction. So you're, you're expressing this change. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, so if, how, you know, how, how, how deep of a process is this? Do you have to lay down on the floor and bang your fists and weep and cry and wail? And, no, all you or can you just, just say, you know, this was a bad decision and I don't want to do that anymore and I'm not going to do that anymore? Is that, yeah. is that enough? Providing it's real. Of course, you have to realize that what you said is powerless. When you say, I'm not going to do it anymore, there's no way you can keep from doing it. It's only by continuing to have that look and focus on Jesus and his wonderful character that gives you the motive for not doing it again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but even though you're, you're confessing that you're not going to do it anymore, it's, um, I don't even know if you're doing that. You're just confessing that you understand what the right way is now. It's not that so much that you're promising that you're not going to do it anymore. I, I don't think you dare promise well, because yeah. you have no ability to perform. That's what the Israelites did. They promised, and look what happened to them. Yeah, well, that takes some time to understand. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you got to try, try actually trying to, to change and finding out how it's successful you are. And then, then you can go back and try the whole proce process and depend on what Jesus promised. Mm -hmm. For those of you who have access to the little book entitled Acts the Apostles by Ellen White, if you turn to pages 35 through 37, basically, and you read about exactly what happened to those disciples in that time of coming together, confessing their faults and their sins and their arguments and all that kind of stuff, and rethinking the whole experience with Jesus. And it was the, that group that marched out to uh, the temple on, Pentecost, on, on the morning of Pentecost and shook the world like it had never been shaken before. Um, it's pretty remarkable. Now, how does a person realize what they are doing is wrong? Um, the promptings of the Holy Spirit. I don't think the youth is being trained in the ways of right and... So, what is the mechanism that was given to the children of Israel to help them identify what was wrong? What was it? The Ten Commandments. Mm -hmm. And there are the list of the things, and if you find yourself out of harmony with what is embedded here, you're you got deep troubles. And they were supposed to teach it to their kids when they rose up, when they walked by the way, when they sat down to eat, when they lied down. It was supposed to be a constant. It was supposed to be something they lived in their lives, and the kids just learned it by osmosis. Exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. You mentioned a minute ago about the great power, the great experience of the, uh, the time of Pentecost. And we're told that the latter rain will be much more than that. Mm -hmm. We look forward to that time. Mm. Yeah, I, we're going to get to that a little bit more. So, yeah. It's kind of interesting, though, the, the latter rain and the, the one that, the former rain, I guess that's what they call it. That happened right after Jesus' death. So what's going to come up later on that's going to be even more than that to, to make a, a latter rain anywhere as powerful as that? Well, Paul said in Romans 2.4, it's the goodness of God that's supposed to lead us to repentance. The goodness of God. Where would you go to read about the goodness of God? Throughout the Bible. And, you know, a lot of people have read the Bible and come away scared to death. That doesn't well, sound like the goodness of God. My um, sister is horrified of the Old Testament. 
Uh -huh. I'm just horrified of the stories. Well, so in other words, you have to not only read the Bible, you have to read it correctly. You have to see the picture of God that's presented from Genesis to Revelation correctly. Yeah. Well, you know, your world view does affect you even when you read the Bible. And even that needs to change. I'm not exactly sure that how, how you could explain that, how that happens, except through time and experience. Well, and, and that was my point a little bit earlier. We're going to ha come along and see some quotations on that in a moment. The point is, if our lives, if we think every day, all day long, and everything we're doing, okay, how can I represent Jesus better? What can I learn from his life and his experience that I can somehow duplicate in my life and my experience and let others see that, that will lead to the kind of change we're talking about. And now, in your living life, though, you're thinking about what do you have to do at work today? You mm -hmm. have to, how you're going to, you're going to uh, appear in front of this client or appear before the boss and all this stuff. Yeah. So Thank there's a Lord. lot of things, there's a lot of things going through your mind. Sure. But what you were talking about was kind of a <coughs> pure thing, well, uh, I, just talking about, you know. Here's what I do. Now, you, you will say my experience is maybe un unusual. Um, yesterday, I was in the middle of a really hectic day. And a gentleman came in, um, a young man who had a lot of problems, came in with his girlfriend or his wife. I didn't, don't remember for sure whether they were married. And he had a lot of issues. And I spent a lot of time with him trying to get them all sorted out, even though I had a whole bunch of other patients waiting for me. I'm a physician, for those of you who don't know. And when I got done, I said, you know, before you leave, I'd like to pray for you. Now, my prayer probably took 30 seconds or something else like this. I prayed for him, and when, he got, when I got done, he said, wow, I've never had a doctor do that to me before. And I, I don't think he's going to forget that right away. No, no big deal. I mean, it wasn't, it didn't cost me $50. Um, I don't yeah, think my boss would have stopped me from doing it. You weren't really thinking about, oh, how can I, how can I, um, represent Christ in this situation, you just kind of automatically did something right then. I mean, well, isn't that, was, that what Christ would do? Well, it would be, but uh, there's a lot of things that hopefully you will do automatically that what Christ would do, and you won't, you won't oh. be constantly thinking about, you know, what would Christ do in this situation? You just do it, yeah. you know. You know that but how does that happen? I'm, I'm sorry. How, how does that happen? How do you get to that place? What is the mechanism by which that automatic stuff comes? The more, the more you practice, the more you think about it. It's, uh, and then after a while, you do it without thinking about it. That it becomes form. more and more uh, yeah. uh, exactly. instinctive or natural or more part of what you are. That quote from Great Controversy 555. Yeah. You know, you might be cold and you become changed, and it's a process. It's your priorities are... So I guess, I guess your point is sometimes you do think about those things. Absolutely. And then you have, to, you have to say, when I first started doing that, it was, it was not natural at all. Mm -hmm. I did it a few times, and I did it a few more times, and I did it a few far, and now it comes quite naturally. Faith I Live By, page 150. As the mind dwells upon Christ, the character is molded after the divine similitude. The thoughts are pervaded with a sense of his goodness and his love. We contemplate his character, and thus he is in all our thoughts. His love encloses us. Then comes that where it talks about looking at the sun and seeing a sunspot and then saying that, that that's the way it should be. We should see Jesus in everything we do. You talked about going to work. And, and meeting clients and all of that kind of thing. But there's no reason why the idea of Christ being with you and you being a representative to that client can't be on your mind. Yeah. And it doesn't hurt to, it doesn't hurt to, uh, matter of fact, it's a very good practice before you launch about your day's activities to take a moment and, and ask that this, you know, this is going to be part of your life. You're setting out in your life today. Um, 
there's lots of things you can ask for. Ask that you want to be more like Jesus. Uh, you want this to be more of your, maybe you e might even ask for, I would really like some opportunities today, Lord, to really put this to work. Mm -hmm. Bring some people to me. Bring me some opportunities. And if it's like my experience, I've done that before. Opportunities have come, they've missed, and then, oh man, here I prayed for that. But it becomes, it becomes more and more and more. It's never perfect. There's and I'm certainly not one to be you, you, any kind of an example here, but, but um, there, yes, there. you are. You, <laughs> you are supposed to be one of those people that talks about in Matthew five. Yeah, well, you know. that's uh, nice to know, but I don't feel like <laughs> I'm doing a very good job sometimes. Well, it's not always exactly you know nice and perfect, and oh, I just prayed for you. Let's take an example that's a little different than that. In his correspondence with the church at Corinth, Paul apparently wrote four letters. Some of you are already very familiar with this. 1 Corinthians 5, 9 mentions a previous letter. That's in 1 Corinthians. So whatever that letter was, it's, some think it might be part of it over in 2 Corinthians. Then there's 1 Corinthians. And then Paul realized that despite those two letters, he wasn't getting the kind of response from the Corinthians that he wanted. So he decided to make a personal visit over there. Um, and uh, we don't have time to go through all the details, but he went over there and they were rude to him. They wouldn't pay any attention to him. They were really nasty. And Paul turned around, went back to Ephesus, probably by boat, and thought, what in the world am I gonna do? And he sat down and he wrote what we sometimes call a signy eye letter. <laughs> and we don't know for sure, but there's a pretty good chance that that signy eye letter is in 2 Corinthians 10 through 13. When you get a chance, look at it. It was strong language. And guess what happened? He sent it by Titus. He said, Titus, you take this letter and see what you can do over there in Corinth. And he disappeared. And Paul didn't hear anything. And he didn't hear anything. He began to get very worried. So he started to walk around because it was a time of the year when you couldn't easily travel by boat. He walked all the way up to Troas, no sign of Titus. Walked over probably to Philippi, we don't know exactly, probably at Philippi he met Titus, and Titus says, guess what? That strong letter worked. So sometimes it might be necessary for us to, in our confessing and repentance and trying to bring things together, and uh, we're, that's really the goal here is to, is to bring people to Christ, we might have to do something that's not so kind and gentle. It might not seem so kind and gentle, um, like Paul did. He commented about that letter. Look at 2 Corinthians 7, 9 through 16. Let me just read those verses. But now I'm happy, not because I made you sad, but because your sadness made you change your ways. What, is it when, what, do, we, what do we call that when you change your ways? Repent. Repent. That sadness was used by God, and so we caused you no harm. For the sadness that is used by God brings a change of heart that leads to salvation. And there is no regret in that, but sadness that is merely human causes death. See what God did with this sadness of yours, how earnest it has made you, how eager to prove your innocence. Such indignation, such alarm, such feeling, such devotion, such readiness to punish wrongdoing. Remember that there were some really wild sinners going on, things going on in the church in Corinth when Paul wrote even his first letter. I mean his first, what we call 1 Corinthians. You have shown yourselves to be without fault in the whole matter. So even though I wrote that letter, it was not because of the one who did wrong or the one who was wronged. Instead, I wrote it to make it plain to you in God's sight, make plain to you in God's sight how deep your devotion to us really is. That is why we were encouraged. Not only were we encouraged, but how happy Titus made us with his happiness over the way in which all of you helped to cheer him up and, and, and so forth. Now, what's the difference between what happened there and when Moses spoke strongly to the Pharaoh and the Pharaoh just got more stubborn? And, uh, but these people, when they were spoken strongly to, got sad and mm -hmm. repented yeah. and changed. Well, one major difference was, of course, is that pagan, uh, Pharaoh was a pagan king who thought he was a god, 
And these people were supposed to be Christians. And they knew there was a God, and it wasn't them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, here's, you know, and, and, and you don't have to repent. I'm, I'm sorry, you don't, have yeah. to, you don't have to confess this too loudly, but think about this. When we were young, many of us learned that it was necessary every night to kneel down beside our beds and make sure we confessed every one of the sins we had committed that day. Because if somehow we forgot one and didn't ask for forgiveness of that sin, we we're lost. It was a very scary idea. That's an Adventist. That wasn't a, another church person. <laughs> I won't, I'm not commenting about my Adventist parents. <laughs> Fortunately, a more careful look at scriptures gives us a different picture about God's love and his care for sinners. And I would like to pick as my example of that, Jeremiah 31, the verse in the Old Testament that's regarded as the, the new covenant in the Old Testament. Jeremiah 31, starting from 31 to 34. The Lord says, the time is coming when I will make a new covenant. What's a covenant? Agreement. An agreement, a, a basically a signed agreement. This is what we're gonna do, right? with the people of Israel, with the people of Judah. It will not be like the old covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt. Although I was like a husband to them, they did not keep that, com that covenant. The new covenant that I will make with the people of Israel will be this. And notice who's doing all the action here. I will put my law within them and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. None of them will have to teach his fellow citizen to know the Lord because all will know me from the least to the greatest. I will forgive their sins and I will no longer remember their wrongs. I, the Lord, have spoken. So what happens if we develop a relationship with God? What does he do about our wrongs? Let bygones be bygones. Let bygones be bygones. In other words, God's saying, we can't go back and change history. All we can do is to try to do a better job in the future. So instead of focusing on our past sins, let's take God's hand and let's see if we can do better in the future. So if God is willing to um, basically, it appears, just forget about the whole thing, then certainly I need to be careful that I don't bring the sins of others if he's willing to forget about it, then I need to be willing. Well, didn't he say, they asked, he was asked, how many times should you forgive? And he says, and somebody says, uh, seven times? And he says, no, 70 times seven. Mm -hmm. What he was really saying is, be forgiving all the time. God is forgiving all the time. In fact, when he hung on the cross, he says, Father, forgive them. Mm -hmm. I take the position that uh, everybody's forgiven, even Hitler and Idi Amin, and you, know, you could put a long list there. The problem is, Everybody needs healing because God says, I'm your healer, I'll restore you. Mm -hmm. But if you don't want to accept the healing, you can still s live in your same well, condition. I would like to take a slightly different approach than we sometimes have to this question of confession and repentance. I believe the whole approach of trying to remember all our sins and ruminate on them in order to ask forgiveness for them is a wrong approach. And my, my basis for that is the famous quote in Great Controversy 555, which was mentioned a little bit earlier in our discussion. And I would like to read it to you now. Think about how this relates to repentance and confession. It is a law, both of the intellectual and the spiritual nature, that by beholding we become changed. So if we're focusing on our past sins, what happens? We do more of them. We, we do more of them. You know, there's that famous story about Burr Rabbit. I think probably most of you have heard it sometime back when you were kids. And uh, the tar baby, and he goes into the raspberry patch, and there's a tar baby. Remember, this is all myth, of course. And I've forgotten exactly what he says, but Burr Rabbit hits him. Well, of course, now his hand is stuck in the tar, and so then he hits him with the other hand to try to get that hand out. Now, And, of course, by the time he's finished, he's completely covered with tar. And if we sit and try to stamp out sin, we try to fight it, that's what's going to happen to us. Get stuck in tar. Yeah. The mind gradually adapts itself. Notice, the mind gradually adapts itself to the subjects upon which it is allowed to dwell. We should try to forget about our sins as quick as we can. That's not a f spiritual statement. 
That's a physiologic <clears throat> statement. Mm -hmm. But it has in, enormous spiritual consequences. Oh, absolutely. So. <laughs> Why is it that people concentrate on their sins then? Well, like Martin Luther, they're desperately afraid that God is going to judge them because of their past sins. So and it's a what, wrong theology. Yes. Basically it. So, so instead of focusing on what we did in the past, which we can't change anyway, it's part of history. God says, let's move forward. Let's try to do better in the future. Take my hand. Let's move forward together and let's do better in the future. The only criteria that God has set up for admission to heaven is simply this. We've got to be neighbors that will be safe to live next door to for the rest of eternity. It, it doesn't matter what happened in the past. If God knew for sure that Hitler would be a perfect Christian from the point, point he entered the, the gates of heaven for the rest of eternity, he would be willing to admit him to heaven. What Don't you think, though, that, that thinking about the past is, is kind of mimicking what's going to happen in the judgment? Because well, when you're in the judgment, you're going to be thinking about what you did in the past. I mean, that's what they're going to be doing, judging you. A lot you. of people will be doing that. So they're going to be, th that might be why they're thinking about the past so much, is because they're worried about what had just happened, and it's going to come up later in the judgment. So how are you going to deal with those things when you get there? You're going to, you're going to say that the people who understand the judgment are going to say, God, I know that some, I did some things in the past which weren't perfect. I, I had this problem, that problem, whatever that was. But God, from now on, I want to do better. And God says, okay, take my hand, let's do better. And every, every day, it ought to be a little bit more in, in, closer to Jesus. So they're going to see that in the judgment in the past? In, in the judgment? That they, mm -hmm. that they have faith that they're taking the hand of God. Mm -hmm. So there's going to be something showing that. Yes. Um, progress. We call it progress. Progress or, or doing some actions that believes mm -hmm. that. So, now, so how do I know that I'm fit to be a, a, a next door neighbor in heaven? Let's suppose uh, Gary has embarked upon this process uh, long ago and I'm kind of new at it. Mm -hmm. And uh, lo and behold, the Lord comes. And uh, he's a whole lot more, I don't know, is he a whole lot door. more, is he a whole lot more fit to next, live next door? And um, how, what, what makes me, well, here, here's what the, here's makes me okay. fit? Okay, let's, <laughs> okay, let's understand that clearly. See, Norm is hardly hold his comment I, there. Yeah, <laughs> come on later. Well, there's two issues here. God says, do you really want to be that kind of a person? Do you really want to be a safe neighbor that lives next? Do you really want to treat everyone around you for the rest of eternity with love? If you say no, he said, I'm sorry. I can't admit people who aren't willing to be loving all the time. Can't admit you to heaven. Now, it doesn't mean you do it. It means that you want to do it. Yeah, that's, but I'll that's, say yes. That's the, I'll well, say yes and get you, in, right? You can't, you, you, uh, you, 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 you can't, you skip the repentance <laughs> part here. Well, here. well, what's, what's going to fool God. keep that from happening? Is God just going to say, you can't fool me, yeah. but, but there's other people there that are looking at me too, saying, well, how come you're not letting him in then? Yeah, because you know? he will look into the future, and he will look into your heart and read your motives and, and the very inner thoughts and present them to the world and say, here's what we're dealing with. He'll, okay, so he'll, he'll look into the future. How does he do that and then show it to everybody else? Well, he can look into your heart, see what it is now. Okay, he can do And that. he can look into the future. As a matter of fact, he does. And he yeah. sees the future as though it were presently happening. Yeah, he can and do so that, that. But what about the other people ah, that are... They don't have to because they trust him. That's it. They, they trust... Well, they trust... God's judgment. Trust God's judgment. Okay. And they should have learned that from the book of Job. Well, yeah, I can see that. But um, what has changed their mind? Because well, let, let me because finish my quotation. There was a question there by the by the devil at the beginning that you can't trust him. Yeah. So that's it, what the whole controversy is about. We yeah. got, we got that pretty well settled at the cross, didn't we? Yeah. Well, let me finish talking about what I was wanted to say here. 
man will never rise higher than his standard of purity or goodness or truth. So who do we need to be looking to as our standard? As I read earlier, Jesus. as the mind dwells upon Christ. Yes. Well, the well, character is molded. If God is judging us on our direction in life, whether we be going down, staying the same, or hopefully getting better, what happens, let's turn this around, what happens to people who are very good, very good, towards the end of their life, they really um, start mm. making mistakes and, uh, and they, they somehow get pulled into sin. Well, I mean, those people are in trouble. The question is, why would they do that? Mm, I don't know, but I've seen that, and I, I didn't know why either, because I thought towards the end of your life, you become more careful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think well, it's pretty amazing, though, that how can you behold Christ when we haven't even seen him? Yeah. Well, let me, I've got a little bit more of the quote left. Okay. Great Controversy 555. If self is his loftiest ideal. And guess who has self as his loftiest ideal? Always. Satan. 100 percent. the guilt on you. It keeps that yep. stirred. He, he will never attain to anything more exalted than self. Rather, he will constantly sink lower and lower. The grace of Christ alone has power, I'm sorry, the grace of God alone has power to exalt man. Left to himself, his course must inevitably be downward. So we've got to have a standard that we look up to or we're in trouble. And Jay, here's where I was, I was jumping a little while ago. <laughs> as the mind dwells upon Christ, your question was posed as you were looking at one man versus another and you got no business doing that. You do that, you can't rise any higher than that guy. You want to be looking at Christ. Mm -hmm. And he says he'll take care of you. Do you believe him? Yeah. Well, like a runner doesn't look to the left and to the right. The runner looks where mm -hmm. he's going. Absolutely. There's a very famous case that runners know about, marathon runners know about. Uh, one of the earlier, well, not the very earliest, but say about 40 years ago or maybe somewhere in that range, two world-class runners were just finishing the Boston Marathon, and they were just doing their utmost. And the one guy that was in a he ahead looked around to see how, he was, how much he was ahead of him. And as he looked this way, the other guy would pass him on this side and he never could catch him again. So, and the message for marathon runners, and this ought to be the message for Christians, don't look back. You've got a goal up there and that's Jesus Christ. Don't that's look back. Right. Well, confession and repentance are essential. But God is not looking over the records, trying by all means to find out if he can find any little mistake that we made some back there that we didn't forget, we didn't realize that we'd done and f asked for forgiveness. He's trying every possible means to save us. Um, God tells us to look away from our sins, to focus our attention on Jesus as more and more we practice living like him. The, the WWJD thing is a little bit worn out the way it's been used, but really the question is a good one. What would Jesus do? And we, we, the point is this, and let me just say this as clearly as I can, you cannot stamp out sin. You keep stamping on sin, it just multiplies. The only way you can overcome sin is by replacing it with something better. So we, we say you can't stamp it out, the only way to get rid of it is to crowd it out. I think that's a miracle statement because yeah. the world tries to stamp it out and it just keeps getting worse and worse and worse. Right. Or stamping out tar, stamping tar. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. Well, look at 1 Timothy 1, beginning with verse 14. Paul has some things to say about that. And our Lord poured out his abundant grace on me and gave me the faith and love which are ours in union with Christ Jesus. So P Paul is saying what? I looked at Jesus and what happened? I was transformed. This is the guy I thought was my worst enemy before, you know. This is a true saying to be completely accepted and believed. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. I am the worst of them. Now let me stop there for a moment. Do we all agree that Paul was the worst of sinners? Well, Why did he say that? <clears throat> I think that 
as he became closer and closer in relationship to Jesus, he saw his own filthiness and and forgetting about everybody else, he just says, nobody could be worse than me mm -hmm. as he looked at the life of Christ and he looked what Christ did for him. He wasn't looking at, 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 yeah. at the people around and saying, well, I'm worse than him. And there was nobody on earth in his look at Jesus that he could think of that was better than him. But God was merciful, he goes on to say, to me, in order that Christ Jesus might show his full patience in dealing with me. Yes. See, look at me not because I'm some kind of saint, but look at what God has done for me in my life. The worst of sinners, he says it again, as an example for all those who would later believe in him and receive eternal life. How many of us have been helped by Paul's words? All of us, right? Oh, absolutely. Has he been an example to all of us? Absolutely. Do we believe he was a perfect saint? No. We, we know he had his problems, but we look to him as an example because of what God, through Jesus Christ, did for him, right? And he yeah. says through God's full patience. So he says that God has the patience to work with you and work with you and work with you mm -hmm. and work with you, however long it takes. Well, another thing, though, um, anybody can say that they're the worst of sinners just mm -hmm. to, to, you know, have everybody back off a little bit. But when he said that, I think they knew what he meant because he used to persecute the fellow brethren. Mm -hmm. And he used to be the most feared person in Christianity yep. at, at that time there. And he's turned clear around. So so I, th I think there was some meaning in his, I'm the worst of sinners too. I think that's exactly right. But I do think there's the other aspect that when we really get a vision of Jesus and his, his holiness, his, the wonderful yeah, character that he that. has, and we that. compare ourselves with that, we can't imagine that there's anybody better than us. Mm -hmm. I yeah. like when Ken says, we have to make ourselves fit for heaven. There are no prisons or, or solitude patty cells that God can put us in. We have to be a cooperating member of the mm -hmm. heavenly society. Absolutely. And how do you get that way? And if you don't want to be there, how do you get there? You that won't way? be because that would be hell for you. Yeah. The only way you can get there is by beholding and becoming transformed. Yeah. Well, the amazing thing is the story's right in, I mean, the little I mean, those four little books that we have are directly about the life of Christ. They're just, uh, well, you know, Paul, I'm, I'm sorry, John says at the end of his gospel, says if everything was written down that he did, I don't think there'd be enough books in the whole world that could contain it all, you know, that passage. And, and I'm sure we're going to spend the rest of eternity yeah. studying what he did. But look at his treatment of sinners. Mary Magdalene, he cast seven devils out of her, seven different times apparently casting devils out of this woman who is a prostitute. And what does he do? He welcomes her into his group. Yeah, come on, you can travel with us. And she was the first one to see him after he rose. Exactly. Now, that's really not known too well in the Bible. People think that he just dealt with Mary when she was brought in adultery. But the Bible does say that after that, um, she fell back into sin and Jesus cast out the demon and then she fell again and he cast out the demon. I mean, look how he worked with her. And I think that we don't really read that in the Bible. We may gloss over it. And the even remar more remarkable thing is the way he treated Simon, who was Mary's uncle. And Ellen White tells us that Simon had been the one who led Mary into sin, his own niece. I mean, and even did, though he was a Pharisee? He was a Pharisee. He was a child abuser. Even the story of Judas is an incredible example of God's patience in dealing with sinners. I mean, did Jesus stand up at the Last Supper when he knew it was, you know, it was already too late for Judas? Why didn't he say up and say, you, excuse me for using this example right now, I'm you, you terrible sinner, you know, why don't you tell everybody what you plan to do? You know, he could have, couldn't he? No, but he didn't. Could have humiliated him it, it, right there. Yeah. He had the opportunity. Well, could we say that then in front of the judgment seat of God, Jesus is not going to embarrass and humiliate us? Absolutely. 
sometimes I wonder if anything will at that time. <laughs> because, yeah. um, I mean, everybody's laundry is going to be out there, you know, and, and <laughs> I don't think there's going to be anything really more embarrassing than a lot of other people have done. Yeah. The model that, was, that we're given, though, is Joshua before the angel. Yeah. And he was there in filthy rags. Yeah. Nothing El looking very good there. Yeah. Ellen White, uh, in another place, Steps to Christ, page 38, first paragraph, says this, which is really, really helpful, I think, for us in, in understanding this whole confession and repentance thing. True confession is always of a specific character and acknowledges particular sins. They may be of such a nature as to be brought before God only. They may be wrongs that should be confessed to individuals who have suffered injury through them. Or they may be of a public character and should then be as publicly confessed. But all confession should be definite and to the point, acknowledging the very sins of which you are guilty. Steps to Christ, page 38. Now, why is it good for us to acknowledge our sins, either to God or to others? Why, why is that good? It, here's the reason. Uh, you're not likely to turn away from something that you aren't willing to specifically admit. You kneel down beside your bed at night or whatever and say, I'm sorry that I'm a sinner. And then you jump into bed, you know, you're not going to stop being a sinner just because you prayed that. But if you say, Lord, I'm sorry that I, whatever it is, that I was nasty today to somebody. And the next time you're nasty to that person or you're inclined to be nasty to that person, you think, you know, I just prayed for forgiveness for that. And hopefully, it won't happen again. You want to do that publicly? No, 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 no. You, you, did you read the, it says, if it's, if it's something you did privately, yes, you confess it privately to God. If it's, I mean, if, if you did it really publicly to somebody else, you might need to confess it publicly. I, because I, it's probably a public problem. Yeah. Maybe. I, Who knows? I heard it, um, uh, actually, it was, as, uh, who, who we would refer to as Elder Detamore, mm -hmm. there was a young man in a church who um, was having a um, a real a, a moment of repentance about mm -hmm. his life, and he was up in front of the church confessing a lot of things. And I remember uh, that for some of the congregation, it didn't seem right, quite appropriate. And I remember Elder Detamore saying something like, uh, public sins should be confessed in public and private sins should be confessed in private. And I think that's very good, yeah. very good advice. Well, there are some examples in Scripture also of false repentance. Can you think of some examples? Judas. Judas. Think of any others? Balaam. What about Pharaoh? Balaam. Esau. What's, what was false about their repentance? What was wrong with their repentance? They didn't have a problem with the sin. They had a problem with the results of it. Exactly. If we're, we're upset about, the, we're not sorry we did it. We're just sorry about the results. Or we got caught. There's a tribe in Africa not too far from where I used to work that literally, that was the motto of the tribe. It's not wrong to steal. It's not wrong to do virtually anything. The only wrong is getting caught. And if they could do it again, like maybe a bank robber is just sorry because he got caught, but if he is left alone, he'll rob a bank again because mm -hmm. that's in his heart. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. Mm. so real so real repentance, real confession should be a part, three things should be part of it. One, we should be genuinely sorry that we have hurt God. What do we mean when we say we have hurt God? We put him on the cross. We've misrepresented him. Yeah. Two, we must admit our guilt and confess of the specific sin which we have committed. No sort of just general hairy fairy kind of stuff. I'm sorry I did that. Okay. And three, a determination to turn away from that sin. The ultimate result of true confession and repentance is a reformed life. That's why, that's why confession and repentance are so necessary for a reformation. You know, Satan does false things. What about all these movie stars that are writing books about confessing oh, yeah. of this and confessing of that? 
and they're giving confession and repentance a bad um, model mm -hmm. and when really the true model is in the Bible yeah well that's pretty sensational stuff that's what they're doing selling books yeah with with a non meaningful repentance yeah, yeah. but it, but I think your point is it, it trivializes yes. real re, real repentance yes it does and and that's what the devil is all about is to trivialize anything that's real yes. David said in Psalm 32 these I'm going to read the first four verses notice the contrasting pictures here happy are those whose sins are forgiven whose wrongs are pardoned happy is the one whom the Lord does not accuse of doing wrong and who is free from all deceit when I, did not, when I did not confess my sins, I was worn out from crying all day long. Day and night you punished me, Lord. My strength was completely drained as moisture is dried up by the summer heat. Say, now which one of those examples would you rather have? Is that David after Bathsheba? That's David after Bathsheba. So is there a proper role for guilt? Absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, if we recognize our mistakes and our sins and feel guilty, as if, and if that feeling of guilt leads to a correct correction of the behavior as far as possible, the result is wonderful. But if the guilt is just a bad feeling, it can be dangerous. Um, look at these words again from Ellen White. This feeling of guiltiness must be laid at the foot of the cross of Calvary. The sense of sinfulness has poisoned the springs of life and of true happiness. Now Jesus says, lay it all on me. I will take your sins. I will give you peace. Banish no longer your self-respect, for I have bought you with the price of my own blood. You are mine. Your weakened will I will strengthen. Your remorse for sin I will remove. That's an incredible statement found in a remote place. There's a series of volumes called Manuscript Releases from Ellen White. This is volume 9, number page 305. When people feel guilt, do they come running to you for pills to dull it? Sometimes. Yeah. Rather than dealing with it? Often, often, I'll tell you what happens often. It, they, 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 they mull over it long enough it starts pr producing physical results and they come in not because they want to get rid of their guilt they come in because they got pain in the stomach oh. or whatever mm. they got going, diarrhea going back to that statement there yeah. mm -hmm. what does it mean to lay your sins on Jesus well that's a good question what he's saying is you don't have to deal with them anymore just give them to me and say okay take my hand let's do better in the future do, it, if you read the story of Martin Luther, he's one of the best examples. I mean, he was developing ulcers and I don't know how many other things. He was so worried about his past sins until he finally discovered at least part of the truth. He never discovered all the truth, but he discovered at least part of the truth of, of salvation. He said, God doesn't, he, he's, God says, please, let's get all that nonsense out of here. I want to have a relationship with you called faith. Don't, don't keep throwing up your sins in front of me. Just bury them behind me so when you're doing that you're laying them off that means for some reason you're taking the guilt off somehow and putting it to him um, it's kind of hard to explain exactly how that happens I don't think it's the guilt that goes it's the it's the it's the fact that you don't have to be punished for those sins he is saying I know you did them, I know you're guilty, but if you come and have this relation with me, you won't have to suffer that because I did it already. So you don't have to die forever. You only have to die of your sins. To your sins. To your sins, right. Die to sinfulness. I'll take care of, that, of the sins for you. I mean, what, what happens when you have a child who makes a bad mistake? Do you say, I don't ever want to talk to you again? Mm. No, you say, let's get that behind us. Let's move on in our relationship. Now, that, I, I can mean, see that part. Way it's, just, it's just how do you take your sin and lay it on Jesus? Well, let me give you an example. When I was in the first grade, 
Oh, I think I may have been in the second grade because my brother was there too and he was a year behind me. Um, we and some other friends found an old car somewhere, just sitting there, sat there. We, and we walked home from school. It was close to play on the way we walked home from mm -hmm. school. And so you know, we saw this old car here and we thought, boy, this is interesting. We started opening it up and looking and so forth and we started taking it apart and we discovered sometime to our great chagrin that this was a very special car that belonged, uh, in, I guess it was originally in running condition that belonged to like the mayor of the town. <laughs> and, and when he found out that we had done this, he charged my father a whole bunch of money to get the car fixed because this was his antique car. Well, who paid the debt? We didn't pay the $50 or whatever it was. My father did. Okay. I think, I think, Gary, what you are, what you're, what you're thinking about here is some kind of a mechanical process. I don't know how to say that. Kind well, of a I'm mechanical, spiritual process. It. I'm trying to explain it to somebody. How do you do that? You don't do it. Uh, yeah, I know, but how do you, okay. I, I, think, it's, I think it's some kind of a medium, of an, exploratory, an ex, ex, explanation medium that God uses to kind of define it. I don't think we lay anything on, on yeah, God. You not. can't get a hold of it. You can't move it. You can't lay it there. You can't literalize that. So you've got to look for the spiritual meaning. Mm -hmm. And basically it says, let me take the responsibility for that. I'll let you off of the guilt. I'll let you off of the punishment. And you stick with me. And I'll make a new creature out of you. Learn more. Jesus yeah. says he's here, there to teach you how to live. We're running out of time. Let me, let me finish with another statement from Ellen White. This is found in Steps to Christ again, page 39. Confession will not be acceptable to God without sincere repentance and reformation. There must be decided changes in the life. Every, everything offensive to God must be put away. This will be the result of genuine sorrow for sin. We don't want to hurt our best friend. And the work that we have to do on our part is plainly set before us. Wash you, make you clean, and so forth. I don't have time to finish up the thing, but finish up that quotation. Steps to Christ, page 39, look at it. It's marvelous good news about how God wants to treat us and how loving and caring he is, and we just have to accept that. And I know it's hard, but that's what God asks us to do. See you next week.